Allah's servant in our midst, let us receive the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Allahu Akbar! Allahu Akbar! Allahu Akbar! In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, we give him praise and thanks for his coming and for his wise choice of the best among us as his messenger, Messiah, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I greet all of you, my brothers and sisters, with the greeting words of peace. Assalamu alaikum. I have a very serious message to give to you today. And I pray that Allah will guide the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart that the words that we speak are acceptable in his sight. We have gathered the laborers from across the nation and from parts of the Caribbean and the United Kingdom and some may be here from Africa. I thank all who came, and I thank all of those who made this day possible. My wife, uh, Mother Khadija, is the hostess of all who are gathered here. And I want to thank her and all the members of my family who have worked very, very hard to make it comfortable for you. I thank my daughter, Betsy Jean, who I told her that we were going to have all the laborers here, saw it almost as a mission impossible. But after it settled that this is what we were going to do, a 
her mind went to working. And she turned a garage into a kitchen. And she, with her husband, my son Lewis, members of the E-team, and others, turned this access house into a meeting place for all of us. I want to thank uh, the cooks. They, uh, they worked very hard, day and night, to make it possible for us to have bean soup, whole wheat bread, and today is a barbecue, so Those of us who are still meat eaters, we'll take care of business today. <laughs> we are happy for the vegetarians. <laughs> there are so many people to thank that work so hard. Through the night, our brother uh, from New York, our medical brother, his name escapes me right now, BJ, Brother Thomas Muhammad. He worked night and day. He's from Chicago? From Chicago. And we had a few medical emergencies that some of our believers had to be stabilized and brought to the hospital. But we haven't lost anyone. Brother Wali is here. And our sister, where's our sister? Where's the sister that had to go to the hospital? Is she here? Raise your hand if you don't want to stand. It's all right. If she's alive, that's the main thing. I want to thank the many members of the FOI from Chicago and elsewhere and MGT. <laughs> that were very wonderful hosts and hostesses of the nation. Brother Minister Dr. Aline and his staff from Washington That's right. And Minister Ishmael and the staff from Chicago. presenters, all of those who came and were assigned to a circle and worked to solve the many problems of our nation. 
If you notice, I have a different mood today. I think it's quite evident. But I guess it's due to the nature of what I'm about to say. To all those who are in the various mosques and study groups throughout America, welcome to the farm. We wanted you to see where those who are in positions of leadership at present are working, and the spirit here has been higher than I've ever seen it in my 52 years of being a follower of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. <laughs> the reason that the spirit to me seems so high is because those who came, came with a mind to work. And we worked in such a collective manner that we invited the presence of Allah who came in the person of Master Farad Muhammad and his Messiah into the room and we all could feel his presence. This being the last day of the conference, I was deeply concerned about what message that I would send you away with and the work that is before us. When I called Minister Aleem to my bedside in the year 2000 after an horrific operation. I didn't call him to my bedside to talk about my operation. I called him to my bedside to talk about the nation and my understanding that the nation had to grow beyond where we were. Many had assumed posts in our nation that they were not qualified to hold. They just had a desire to help spread the word of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, but they were not trained. And some did a fairly good job, and some used such a position to dominate, to dictate, and to kill the spirit of those who came forth to help me but were killed before their gifts and skills and talents could be unpacked that they might give to our advancement what they came to give. Sometimes it really wasn't their fault. It's just a problem with black people or with human beings. It's a human problem when through efforts we rise into some 
position of authority over a fellow human being that we don't know how to handle authority. And we get drunk off of some sense of power over others and instead of encouraging and inspiring and motivating and raising people to where God wants them raised. The sick-minded ones want to make slaves of those who came to be free. This has been a problem in every organization on the earth. No matter how brilliant people are, they can't seem to handle authority. We get filled with ourselves. And to hell with the mission. So these that sit before me are in the most dangerous position that any human being can be in because you have authority over the people of God and you will be judged on how you use that authority. So I'm here today to serve a death warrant. Not actual physical death. Allah will take care of that because no one who abuses his people will get away without being chastised by him. If the enemy who enslaved us and oppressed us cannot escape the justice that he is due. How does anyone in this room think that we can escape mistreatment of the people of God? Our brother, Michael Vick, is being punished for mistreatment of a dog. It is justified. by the law of God that he gives us as human beings supremacy over all his creatures, but he does not want us abusing a dog, a cat, 
any creature, even when we slaughter them so that we may eat them, we have to do it in the most merciful manner and recite his name over what he created for our benefit. us for mistreatment of the lesser life that has been created to serve us, how much more will he punish those who mistreat another human being? Regardless of their color, but what makes us like this? What is the sickness in human beings that when we ascend to positions of authority over another human being, we all of a sudden think we have authority to abuse. So we talk to men and women like we're speaking to a dog or something less. There's a price that everyone has to pay in the day of judgment, which is now. How did you treat my servants? Master Farad Muhammad didn't come to North America for Elijah Muhammad alone. He came for every one of us. And the only reason that Elijah Muhammad had value with him is because of the heart that Allah gave him of love for all of us because Allah tried him. And he said, Master Farad said to him, You and I will go, and I'll make a nation out of you and kill the rest of them. And Elijah Muhammad said, if you kill them, kill me too. didn't care of the master that had called him that he could make a nation out of him. That's easy for Allah to do. But Elijah Muhammad loved us so much he said, I don't even want to fulfill no promise with you. If you're going to kill them, kill me too. The Savior looked at him and said, I knew you would say that. That's why he chose him. And the Quran says, Allah knows best where to place his message. He don't place it on a heart. That is filled with vanity and self-seeking and arrogance. He 
places it on a heart that doesn't feel worthy of the job at hand and wonders why did God choose me for such a task I am not worthy I don't have the skills Moses was full of excuses But I, I can't speak plain. I, I, I can't, I can't do this. And every excuse that he made, Allah knocked it down. Because he knew best where to place his message. He never chose a prophet that thought himself bigger than the people he was chosen to serve. So, are we fit? You got to ask this of yourself. Because you may not be in a position of leadership too much longer. Ask yourself the question, am I fit to serve Allah and the rise of a people stuck in the mud? And if you say, I am, you can be excused from this meeting. already unfit. Because the truly fit person is the one who's always seeking to be fit. That's why Jesus said, he who would be greatest among you, let him be your servant. The problem with an ex-slave is that he was taught always to serve the master, never to serve his people. And the problem with the master's education is it makes its possessor feel that you are better than those who don't have what you have. I don't want to kill your spirit. <laughs> but if you're going to be my helpers beyond today, and I'm demanding a change in all of you or I will get rid of all and get me a new group who will love Allah and love the messenger and love the word and love our people and will be willing to bow down and serve our people.
I love you. But I don't love our service of our people. There's a lot of knowledge in this room. But what good is it if it's not supported by good character? Some of us feel that uh, authority means we can do as we please and judge others when they fall short. But those of us in leadership be the first to be judged. So, my brother, Dr. Aleem, referred to the commission that I commissioned him and others to do was to put their minds to work to see if we could do the work of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad better. That's all it was. And he called it, I didn't tell him to call it this, he called it this, the Atonement Commission. You know, in 1995, when, uh, or 94, when we were working, getting ready for the Million Man March, it was Reverend Dr. James Bevel who came to me when I told him what I wanted to do. He said, well, that, that sounds like atonement, brother. It didn't come from me. It came out of his mouth. And I said, you know, that word resonates with me. Atonement. I don't like that word. And when we went to the preachers, calling it a day of atonement, they said, we ain't got nothing to atone for. Jesus paid it all. I said, well, wait a minute. Jesus paid the price all right, but he didn't pay the price so we could continue to sin without consequence. He paid the price to open the way so that we could return to the exalted position that we once held with God. What do you mean you don't have to atone? Some of the pastors fought me, and some joined me. But on the day of atonement, when they saw nearly two million black men out there on a Monday, then everybody that could find a way to get to the microphone. it was in the year 2000 that the name Atonement Commission was brought up by Dr. Ali. And he said the nation needs to atone. And we in this group like the preachers What do we need to atone for? Six years 
later. Here we are. And we know now that we have a reason to atone. Why should we atone and why should those in this room lead the atonement? See, evidently, we thought this was a preaching assignment. So we became experts at preaching. No, 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 not expose them. See, that arrogance got to cease. It ain't about them. It's about you. This is no damn Cinderella house where only one person can wear the shoe. Everybody that's standing on the wall, sitting in a chair, try your shoe on and see how it fits. I'm going to start with myself. I have to lead the atonement of our nation. What do you have to atone for, brother? The condition of the people under my leadership. kept asking, you know, what is this one more thing I got to do? And I was trying to find it. Must be this. Must be that. And I kept doing something. In Savior's Day, I knew I wasn't going to be among you too long. I didn't see death. I said, well, maybe it's time for me to go on to the Father. Then I had a laborers meeting and I asked to go look at the school. I haven't been in the school for a long time. And one of my sons said, Dad, have you seen the school lately? I said, no. He said, well, maybe unannounced you should just go see. So I did. Mr. Ishmael, Sister Shelby were by my side. We were walking. I looked at dirt and grains. I mean, and grain in the floor. There was a brother with a mop. He was, it was a dust mop, but the mop was blacker than anything in this room. The mop dirty. I said, Minister Ishmael, I said, the condition of this house is the condition of the hearts and minds of the people in the nation of Islam. I said, you take the messenger's picture down, take my picture down, because this place don't represent him or me. And 
And I went home that night grieving. And the next morning I awakened with a smile because I remembered the words of the messenger to me when the laborers in number seven had messed up and I wasn't a part of it. So I went to the messenger with nothing in the pot. I knew he was going to bust my laborers. And then he looked at me and said, well, brother, you are the minister. So I hold you responsible. I know when I went to New York, he told me what he wanted me to do. You do the preaching. And you let them handle the business. But when they're handling the business, messed up the business, he didn't blame them. He wanted me to take over the house. And I went back to New York and took over the house and used the money that he had given me for my family. Moss number seven, and from that day till the day that I left, not one check with my name on it and Muhammad's name on it ever bounced. Every business was put in the black. Every school was running again, and we had 18 mosques. that came into divine order. So I, I couldn't blame Minister Ishmael and the council. I couldn't blame Sister Shelby and the teachers. I said, Brother Farrakhan, Allah and the messenger didn't put the mission on them. He put it on me. So I said, well, how can I go to my father with us in this condition? I mentioned it to Mother Tynetta. She said, yes, brother. She said, Moses went to the mountain to see God, and he asked him, what are you doing here? <laughs> Can't you see the condition of the people that you left? So, I remember reading in the scripture that Paul, the great apostle, could not go to get his reward for his faithfulness until Christ was formed in the people. Well, he's already formed in me. But I can't go anywhere until I see him formed in you, in you, and in those whom you claim to lead. So I decided, since I'm responsible, in every mosque or study group that have Muhammad name on it, that's my name. And my father's name. And the God's name. So if those are your followers, you take your followers and go.
But if they are mine, to follow you, to me, to him, then I'm taking over all the houses under that name until Christ is formed in you all. If you don't like that, if Muhammad's mosque has been your personal thief dump, if you are God in your mosque and beside you there is no other, well, uh, I intend to destroy your playpen. And if you really want to be a helper of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, then you're going to have to come and follow me. Some of you, some of you want to lead the people to Elijah Muhammad and leave me out. Some of you feel that as long as you know what's written in the books, written by him, you don't need me. You can take the people to the Father without me. Well, I'm here to tell you today that I am the door to my Father. And you can't get to my father except you come by me. My father made ministers yesterday and he's given me authority to make them today. So I will make the ministers henceforth now until God comes. Satan is upset, and the Satan in you is upset, but I'm going to exercise today and drive Satan out of you.
I'm going to cast out devils in the name of our Father. Some of you, brothers and sisters, really want to be ministers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I do too. He said if he had ten like me, he could take the country, meaning get all our people. Well, there are more than ten up in here. But the question is, they're not like me. Now, what's wrong with me that you don't want to be like me since I have the love of the people that God made them to love me, why don't they love you? He set me in front of you as an example. Not that I'm perfect. No, I'm not perfect. So he could tell me, take off your shoes, Farrakhan, for the ground where you stand is holy. Not that I'm holy. He didn't say, take off your shoes, Moses, you are holy. He said, take off your shoes, Moses, the ground. Where you stand is holy. Why? Because I'm standing there with you. I'm not perfect. I went all over the world spreading his word because he told me that the job of the messenger is only a clear delivery of the message. Well, I've done it. But then he said to me, it's going to take more than preaching, brother, to get our people. And I said to myself, well, Father, just give me time, and I'll preach, and I'll preach, and I'll try to get them because I'll try to make the words so plain. But after I saw the school, and the condition of the hearts of the people, I said, oh, so this is what he meant. Not just chastisement, but preaching alone is not going to save our people. Now we're getting into the real phase of this today. What's the theme of this conference? Stop, stop. Say that again. Now, lesson number one. Question number 11. Master Farad 
to whom praise is due forever, is asking of his servant, Elijah Muhammad, who was three years old in the teachings. Have not you heard that your word shall be born regardless of whom or what? That was Master Farad asking that question. And our leader answered, yes, my word is born, and born is life, and I will give my life before my word shall fail. question I'm asking now of us. Are we his followers? Did he just answer Master Farad Muhammad for himself? Or did he answer him for you and for me and for all who would come to this mission? Did he answer for you? Did he answer for you? Did he answer for me? Yes, sir. So, what word did Elijah give to Master Farad Muhammad that caused such a question to be put as a lesson to be learned by all those who became registered Muslims. My prayer, my sacrifice, my life, my death is all Lord of the world. He said, I will give all that I have. And all within my power to see the day that the devils will be brought into hell. Sitting in this audience today are two men whom I love and admire of many that are sitting here. But these two are special. Brother James Naji, stand up, Brother James, please. He was the first minister that I heard when I went to Muhammad Mosque number seven in New York to really be converted to the messenger of God, Brother James Naji. <laughs> Seated next to him is Brother Thomas Jihad, who was there when I first opened my eyes, these two were in the FOI when I was asked after saying my student enrollment to say something to the men that I was going to become a part of. And with tears running down my face. I said then that I will take this word to every nook and every cranny of the United States of America and my word is born.
have suffered every day since I've been a follower of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I've known poverty, excruciating poverty. I've known the murderous plots of hypocrites and devils that sought to kill me and my whole family. I've known what it's like to teach my heart out and have some of the people that I was teaching believe that I had taken their money and had some secret house somewhere. I lived under the envy and the jealousy of many who thought that the messenger favored me. But I worked through my pain because the cause for which I was raised is bigger than any Negro who could give me pain, bigger than any hypocrite or envious believer that did not like me. I don't give a damn who don't like me. If Allah loves me, what do I care? But here's where I think I need to atone. I didn't fully realize that my word to him to preach is not all there is. But in order to make his word bond, then through me and through us must come to fruition his vision for our people. Where are the farms? Where are the factories? Where are the institutions? Where are the hospitals? The clinics? Where's the beef cattle? The milking cows? The wheat fields? How can we take our mouth out of the kitchen of our enemy? if we are not producing enough food for all of our people to eat. So the theme of this conference is making i got to walk a little. What is the theme? Do you want to help me make his word bond? If we make his word bond, will any of your needs personally not be met? Will you help me to do more than talk now? but to bring into reality what the talk made our people envision. <laughs> Talking about the earth, 
bringing forth wheat and asking God to give us our daily bread, but we don't have any earth to plant the wheat seed, then we still believe in a mystery God. But we have tried that mystery God for 450 years and we got nothing but hunger, nakedness, out of doors and were beat and killed by those who advocated that we should believe in a mystery God. But the people that believe in a mystery God are the poison animal eaters. What poison animal have we been eating? You forsake the pig. But you allow poison thoughts poisonous ideas to poison the bloodstream so that you are a Muslim in name but you can't act. Act! The first book I think it's in the New Testament is called the book of Acts didn't say the book of talk. The book of Acts. The Acts of the Apostles is what made the people to believe in Jesus and see Jesus as their Savior. What are our Acts? We've heard the talk. The scripture says, let your light so shine before men. That they will glorify your father which are in heaven. Let your light so shine that they may see, not hear. They've already heard the good words. Now they must see your good works. For it is seeing our works that will make the people glorify our Father. Who's above us in the wheel or wherever he wants to be? <laughs> well, Jesus said, if I be lifted up from the earth. I will draw all men unto me. Now listen, this is critical now. You a little sleep, go get some water, wash your face. There's fire coming down. See, yeah, that's right, my brother. See, these last few days, it's like the Holy Ghost came into the room. No, this is, this is real. Right, right, right. I saw a spirit in you that you felt you had the power now to go do the work. 
Was I wrong or did I, did I not see you correctly? Straighten me out. Oh, I didn't miss it then. Okay, listen, here we go. Minister Willie from New Orleans, is he here? Stand up. Minister Robert from Houston, stand up. They went to the tenth or the second anniversary of Katrina. And both of them wrote me a report. In their report, they said the crowd was less this year than last year. And listening to some of our young people, it seems as though they lost hope. Is that your report? Is that your report, Minister Willie? Question. Our hope is lost, the dry bones said. Our bones are dry. We are cut off from our part. Why is there hopelessness among them? And whose fault is it? See, if we had done more than talk, if we had raised the flag by building institutions instead of talking madness, showing off authority, Dominating people, pushing people out when we should be pulling people in. If we had given them something to look at, they wouldn't be hopeless. They would say, let's run to the nation of Islam because Islam comes after everything else has failed. Everything has failed. Now the nation of Islam must rise up Make his word bond. Listen, listen, listen. He said, My word is bond, and bond is life. How can we give life to the dead unless we make his word bond? For them as well as for us. Come on. I had a great former foreign minister, jurist, spend a week at the farm with me. He's 90 years old. He was the lawyer that fought for Jomo Kenyatta and the Mau Mau in Kenya. And there were several people <clears throat> in a list of persons that he admired. And there were 17. 
And of the 17, two were followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Malcolm X, Muhammad Ali, and the third one was myself. Now, I went to bed that night, and I thought that I would ask him the next day, why isn't the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, who is the teacher of those that you admire, among those whom you admire? His answer was, I don't know anything about him. He's my friend. I call him dad. But he doesn't know anything about the man that made me somebody for him to admire. Why don't they know him? It is because he has not yet been lifted up from the earth. Well, how do we lift him up? Make his word bond. And once we make his word bond, no student of the master will be looked at above the master. They all will look to the master by the work of his Jesus was long gone. But there was Peter, there was Paul, there was James and John. And you know what they did? They raised the dead. They made the blind see. They healed people. So the word went out. By what power do you do these things? And everything that they did, they did it in Jesus' name. And today, Jesus, that was born in a manger, in a tiny little state called Palestine, is known all over the world because of the act of his apostles. Are you with me? We'll see. Now, the next part of that theme is a new beginning. We were taught in the numerical system of the language of mathematics, you have one through nine. When you get to nine, you come back to zero, which is death, no time, no measure nothingness unless one comes. When we have run the course and come to nothing and recognize our nothingness,
and we call for the one to come. To stand behind nothing and generate power from one into nothing, making it ten. And every zero that you add to zero with one behind it, it becomes a number that no man can number. A new, a new beginning. We need the one to come again into our lives. And we need to connect to him and beg him to connect with us so that the power of the one can generate through nothing to make us something. Could you put the diagram up on the board for those in the mosques to see of the circles that we had here? I want them to see what we went through over this four-day period. And I want to thank all those who sent me emails that wanted to come. And they were literally begging to be a part of this. But unfortunately, we did not allow others to come who were not a part of those ministries. But don't worry. You have been on our hearts all the time to release you and your talent for the building of a nation. Why is it taking so long? I thought they were ready. Well, we'll go on. We had 30 circles with 24 persons in every circle. Minister Aleem thought of the wheel and spheres within spheres. So we decided that down here we would try to duplicate what was going on up there. So we formed wheels within wheels. Circles of 24. Will you tell us who makes Holy Quran or Bible? And why does Islam renew her history once every 25,000 years? And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, we write history to equal the circumference of our planet. As it's 24,896 miles in circumference, rounded off, it's 25,000. And since every planet inclines to the plane of its orbit 23 degrees 30 minutes, we use 23 scientists. And one was the judge. Mm -hmm. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, it is Master Farad Muhammad's desire to bring us up to equality with the scientists that control weather Raise mountains and write history before it's done. We write it in advance, then walk into what we've written. So in this new beginning, 
since the scripture says, ye are all, what? Children of? So we put 23 gods in a circle. Female and male gods. Male and female created he them. Them. So them is here. And them was in the circle. And them came up with brilliant ideas. And the facilitator was the 24th. But not the judge. Then we had a circle that had nobody in it reserved for Allah and his message. So when we did our work in the circles, being of one accord, being of one mind to solve the problems of our nation, we called into our circles the presence of that circle where we left it open for him. We can go nowhere without the one. I don't know whether Minister Ishmael told you, but this is my 30th year. You told him? Then I don't have to repeat it. Did he tell you? That I came to birth sometime between the first and second week in September, and I don't know the date. Yes, uh, 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 did, did he tell you? Yes, well, this looked like a little manger too. Sometime between the first and second week of September, a new birth. A new beginning to the nation of Islam, rising to a new level to make his word bomb. Okay. The last part of that is the hereafter for my followers is tomorrow. Next year? When is it? Okay. Here. Here. After the power of the enemy has been broken on our minds. Here. Is where the hereafter begins. And then it spreads in our families, in our communities, hereafter. The Quran says, in the hereafter, everywhere you look, peace, peace, peace. For these days that we've been here, what did you see? What did you feel? And, and more? Peace. When you have that kind of peace, the Quran says it makes for unlimited progress. No rise and fall. No night and day. A continuous day because the light of God is in your midst. Ain't no night when God is present.
Now, he said, in the hereafter, there'll be no sickness. If you start getting sick, we know you broke the law. He said, in the hereafter, no hospitals, no insane asylums. Why? Because the burden of sin is lifted off your mind. When you stop sinning, you can relate to another overcomer of sin, and it produces out of the law love. And the stress of being a Negro is over and you feel relief. Now listen, I want every follower of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to experience the beginning of the hereafter. So when you go back home, your job, well, it's my job now. You don't mind. Because I'll be teaching in your mosque. Because it's really my mosque. That's what it is. And, uh, How did they get in the hereafter? Well, you know, I guess when Jesus was born in the manger, they had flies because the animals were showing up in there. <laughs> I'm almost where I want to be. I'm going to teach and I'm going to invite others whom I approve of to come to Chicago and teach the nation. The rest will be quiet. Listen, listen, listen. And study. Now, some of you are just not cut out for the ministry. It's okay. There's something for us to do when we're building a nation. But if you're not minister material, don't worry about that. You just were not cut out for that. But you're cut out for something. I just needed help, so I threw you where maybe you didn't belong. But now, I want to help qualify all of those who would be ministers. We're going to set a curriculum for you. And then I'm going to test you to see if you're worthy to stand in front of God's people. Not because you can memorize something. But because you're living the life that you preach. Well, where do I fit? I'm coming to you in a minute. In you, that means God is growing in you. That's why the scripture says, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. But you have to let him grow 
in you. Well, you can't, he can't grow in you unless you feed on him. Now, I am on, I'm coming to something now. It might shock you a little bit. Well, you just be shocked, that's all. Listen. In the workbook, the pedagogy of God and the messenger, that was a great subject. I'm going to say something about the pedagogy because now I want to show you how you can become what you say you want to be. <laughs> See, first, we want to be Muslim. That comes before any position. Well, you know, all right, I'm Dr. So-and-so. I'm lawyer so-and-so. I'm engineer so-and-so. I'm entrepreneur. I'm a multimillionaire. Yeah, good. Come on in. Must I soldier? Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Everybody in this is a soldier, young and old. And if you don't want a soldier, get out of this. Wait, wait. See, nobody in the kingdom is too good to be a soldier. Everyone who comes to Christ is a soldier. In the army of the Lord to conquer Satan. So you got to know your general orders. You got to know what makes a soldier. You got to fall in and hop hard. to who you are, but your root is a soldier for God in Islam. Well, I got a cane. I can't soldier. Hell yes, you can. Bring your cane and knock it down. <laughs> bring your walker bring your wheelchair I'm a soldier. I love soldiering. I'll die on the battlefield for my Lord. Okay. Now. See, the reason I'm saying this How many of you are in the ministries? Raise your hand. Raise them high. See, when you get into a ministry, 
some people are vying to be the minister of. Don't do that. Don't even call yourself the minister of. You striving to be. I'll tell you when you become that. Now, wait a minute. Well, minister, what do you know about art and culture? Oh, hell, I'm the chief musician of the Lord. I know a lot about art and culture. <laughs> what do you know about science and technology? The God that came is the first scientist. He spoke in formula. My father, Elijah Muhammad, was the second scientist. He translated the formula. But I am the third scientist. And I'm writing books on what the father taught. So you can't tell me nothing about these ministries that you think you are hip and qualified for. I am a doctor. I'm healing an entire nation. I am a lawyer. I fight with the law of God. I am an educator. I am a minister of information. I'm the best foreign minister you got. In fact, the only one. So you still got to come by me. I'm so fired up. <laughs> I need a drink. Water, that is. All right, now, sit down, sit down. He who would be greatest among you let him be your minister. Let him be your servant. Every one of these ministries are in the service of the needs of our people based on the vision of Allah who came in the person of Master Farad Muhammad and what he gave to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad for us. And if you don't know them, those two, you can't serve here. See, I'm not interested in somebody that came to follow the messenger because they like him as a leader. Thank you for coming. You're welcome. I'm not interested in nobody who said, I don't believe in no mothership, but I'll be damned. I, that Elijah is something else. Well, thank you for coming. I like the way these Muslims talk to the enemy. They got macho. So I'm joining. Thank you for coming. But I can't use you in those top positions. I can't use you. You can fit in, but you can't lead. I'm a great businessman. I, I bring my talent to the nation. I want to help them grow economically. Very good. You're welcome. But you can't lead economic development for us. Because we're not functioning on the business cycle of this world.
We're not functioning like that. I don't care how you do business. But in here, it's the way God wants us to do business in serving the needs of our people. Other than that, you, you can't fit here. So, you mean I got to study them lessons? That seems so beneath me after all. I'm a doctor and I have my Ph.D. degree in ignorance. Let me make it even clearer. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said this to me. He wouldn't give two cents for all of the scholarship that's in our world of Islam. Two cents. And those of you who are not scholars in Islam and think you're scholars somewhere else, let me tell you what the Bible says. The wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. So don't bring foolishness in the house and think foolishness is going to sway the day. Farrakhan, are you saying that all the years that I studied is really foolishness? Yeah. That's exactly what I'm saying. We need to get our damn money back. Because nothing that they taught you makes you able to build a world for yourself and your people. You are a beggar in the white man's house with the white man's education. <laughs> Minister Farrakhan. Minister Farrakhan. Yes. Yeah. Is there some good in what I got? Plenty. Praise the Lord. There's lots of good in what you got. But don't put it over what God brought to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. That must be your foundation. We're in agreement. All right, sit down. You that's in the role of a captain. I, I think we're making a mess of our father's law. And... I don't want law administration right now. I want us to study his law and become lawful. Then I'll let you talk to me about administering law on somebody else when you are not living up to the law yourself. Uh, well, brother, I put out several people last week for breaking the law. That's right, and I'm putting you out next week. How you like that? Because you know damn well you worthy to get the hell up out of here.
unless we can apply the law to ourselves first. Don't be a hypocrite and apply the law to somebody else that you are breaking yourself. Oh, yeah. Now, captains of the FOI, you're in charge of the security of the mosque and the believers. You're in charge of the security of your ministers. Some of us have gotten a little drunk with the heady wine of power. I'm talking about ministers. I'm talking about captains. I'm talking about secretaries. I'm talking about sister captains. I'm talking about protocol directors. Who in the hell are you? Just look at yourself. Just look at yourself. I'm going to put the mirror up here. Let's all take a look. How many prayers are we missing? How much charity do we give? Some of us don't even come to the mosque except to get some money and get the hell up out of there where you can keep going. Some of you don't even show up. Some of the ministers like security around them. They, they think they're the minister, you know. They got to be flanked by 10 and 12. <laughs> the hell is that? I don't say we shouldn't have security, but not for show. See, that arrogant crap is over. I got to go in some place with 10 FOIs. Like somebody going to bother me. Some of them that's soldiering in there with you want to take your damn head for your foolishness. Sister Captain. I think I should sit down, everybody. You know? And let's start again. It's a new beginning. It's a new beginning. We don't know who you are. We're going to find out shortly. You can occupy the seat, but don't call yourself nothing. You can open the mosque, but don't call yourself nothing. I'll call you who you are when you prove yourself to me. Because the first examination is before the apostles.
Now wait. This doesn't mean that those who are listening in the mosque, that when these come back home, you're going to start up some mess. Because you'll find yourself in the street. Because better than you and I is right outside the door. These are going to qualify themselves to be your servant right along with yourself. So don't give them no flack when they come home. Help them. I didn't know that was coming. But look, why you want to be called a minister? It's like somebody calling you father and you don't have no sperm. You couldn't make a baby if you wanted to. Twiddly D and twiddly dumb. So we can't call you Papa unless you make something. How the hell are you going to be a minister and ain't got nobody in the mosque? You couldn't raise the dead if the dead started waking up. You'd say, what the hell is wrong with that one? do I know this? I'm looking at your reports. There's very few of you who show real progress in the raising of the dead. Why? What's wrong with you? How did you become impotent? Oh no, not important. But you know what? See, it's this feeling of importance that made you impotent. That's why the lesson said, have no importance among the laborers nor the officials. There are no big eyes and no little U's. Now look, to all those in the mosque that's listening, and the hypocrites that's listening too. In 1982, I took away all titles and I said we must first be brothers. There's too many cliques. Too many clicks. I never ask you to call me honorable. That's what you did. And I never asked you to call me apostle. That's what some of you did. But I like brother. I like, I like being a brother. And then a brother servant. A brother minister. A brother servant. So when they call me on the phone, I say, how can I serve you? How can I serve you? I like being a servant. I mean, it makes me feel good that you want to carry my bag or, you know, I have a little problem and I do need a little help carrying heavy things. But even the bag that's heavy ain't heavier than you. And I'm carrying you, a nation, on my shoulders. So 
look, you still have the position of servant. Servant in the ministry. Servant in the captaincy. Servant in the secretary. But just don't, don't make people call you big man. Let's earn it. But we got to do it the old-fashioned way. We're going to have to study and work to show ourselves approved. When I met Thomas J. and Brother Najee, well, Thomas J. took me by the hand, bless his heart, Stopped me from cussing and a whole lot of other little faults that I had. And he was so sweet about it. Said, you really need to come back again, chief. Because I've been cussing since my father left. And I'm trying to do better, damn it. I mean... I'm only teasing with you. But I'm trying to do better because that kind of language is unworthy of a representative of God and his Messiah. You just can't use your rostrum to get off on people. Some of you are cowards. And you don't want to say nothing to the person directly. In the name of Allah. And then you go to beating the hell up out of people. Everybody know who you're talking about. But. Brother Farrakhan started by saying this ain't no Cinderella show. I'm talking about everybody, including myself. Ride as you want. We have to atone for not making his word bond. You, the believers, through the Savior's Day gift, have given me money that allowed me to pay for the mosque in New York, pay for the mosque on the west side, help many believers who need money, help, pay some of the debts of Mosque Mariam, then pay off the mortgage on Mosque Mariam. Pay off the farm in Georgia. Pay off the farm in Michigan. Because you gave me that. And I got enough in the kitty to make my atonement. See, it starts with sacrifice of yourself and what you can afford to give. Brother Carl, step up front and center, quick. Hut, ho, hut, 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 ho. Brother Carl is an architect. And he came and saw what it would take to bring our mosque all the way up because patchwork had been done over the 19 years since we've had Mosque Mariam. But it really needs some work. Now, he gave me a bill. For a roof 
on the mosque and the school. How many thousand square feet is that? 57,000, did you say? 50,000? Yes, sir, 50,000 square feet. It's a total. Yes, sir. And the bill is $360,000. I gave them $75,000 down. They'll finish in a timely fashion, and they'll be paid from the Savior's Day gift. But we had a boiler problem where our babies come to school hot in the summer, cold in the winter, because of a problem with the boiler. How much does it cost to put two new boilers in and renew all that work so that the believers at Mosque Mariam and whoever our guests are will never have to worry about heat or air? $225,000. $225,000. Add it up. Plumbing. 60000 Tuck pointing. Tuck pointing, $37,000. $37,000. Keep on adding. By the time he got finished with me, it was nine hundred. $37,000. And I told you a million. We rounded it off to a million. But you gave it to me. I'm giving it back to you. Listen. I always spend on you before I spend on myself. This is true. But that ain't all. We're going to bring the salam all the way up. How much it costs, brother? 95363 dollars. Restaurant $5,363. Wait. That's for the restaurant. But we're setting up a brand new National Bakery. How much that cost? Three twenty-five. Three hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars. And we're gonna make his word bond. I want you to watch this. See, he said Chicago would be the capital of Islam in the Western Hemisphere. So every building of ours, of yours in Chicago has to be right where it should be. This is the capital. We have a warehouse across the street that we own. We're going to fix it up because I got plans for it. I'll tell you about it in a minute. 25,000 square feet. It would take 350,000 to get it where we want it, and then we're going to have to spend a few million. Now, the messenger had a design for a new school added to Mosque Mariam. He already designed it, had the architect lay it out. We have got to do nothing but build it. I asked him, what did it cost? $9.6 million. Okay. All right, now. It's a building across the street that we used for the millions more movement when negotiating to try and buy it. Because we need more office space and the millions more movement needs a headquarters. We're in the process of getting that building. Now, I want to show you something. Every building in Chicago is owned lock, stock, and barrel by you. We don't owe nothing to nobody. 
now. Wait. I'm going to start with this right here, the farm. You gave me the charity. We built this place literally from scratch. Nothing that you see here was here when we got it. This is the combined vision of my wife, my family, and the workers who worked on this. And here it is. The Native American brothers put a casino right up the hill. Some of you have been there. I better not see you pulling no levers up in there. But because of that casino, all the land around here has doubled, tripled, quadrupled, and really is off the chain. This property here is worth now well over $10 million. And nothing that you see on this property of machinery has a note on it. Everything is paid for. Thank you. I spend most of my time right here. When I was real sick, Minister Aleem came and we walked the track. I had just come out of the hospital and it was March, getting into spring. And he said, Minister, you need to stay here because the leaves are beginning to bud and you are coming up like out of a winter season and this would be a good place for you to heal. And I took his advice and I began to stay here more. I fixed up the palace two years ago from the dome all the way to the basement. I spent $600,000 of money that you gave me to fix up your house because it ain't mine. See, you know, preachers, when they have something, you look, you see their name on it. Then they turn it over to their sons. The palace belongs to you. The mosque, the school, the final call, every business we have, everything we got, the salam, all of it is yours. My name is on nothing. I live to see a nation come into being. See, it ain't personal with me. Because I'm a finite being who will pass away. But the nation is forever. So when you work for the nation, you work for your own eternal life. When you work for yourself, you work for that which is finite. And when you die, it ends. I fixed up the palace in Phoenix. If you haven't seen it, you need to go see it. All paid for. It's worth, I don't know, about $2 million. I might not, might not get it because of the neighborhood, but... The messenger built the palace for 1,250,000 in 1970s dollars. To replace the palace now is anywhere between 6 and 10 million. We spent 5 million building the salam. We didn't build it with no fake concrete and fake steel. This 
is no Negro construction. The best materials went into it because I wanted not for me to live in a palace and you come to a mosque that was degenerate or the people come to a restaurant that was not worthy. So it was called the people's palace. 24 karat gold is in Mosque Mariam in the arches. That ain't no fake stuff. You got mega churches, but not with mega material. Now, this is business. We talk a little business. If we add up what the nation owns in Chicago, the value of replacing it could come between 30 to 40 million dollars. If you add Phoenix and the farm, you're up to over 50 million. Well, I'm making my sacrifice. And we're going to make his word bond. So I'm going to ask you to join me. I want 10,000 people by Savior's Day to give me $1,000. Listen, listen! That's 10 million cash dollars. Added to 40 to 50 million equity. Now, I need bankers, those who know how to leverage money and equity because what we have is over a half a billion dollars in equity and cash through leveraging in order to make his word bond it's going to take money i'm not going to make a pretty school physically and not pay teachers Uh, come up, Brother Larry and Sister Shelby. Larry. Sister Shelby has been our directress from the beginning almost, just about from the beginning. The school has produced many who are who's who in American education, not Negro education. In practically every graduating class from the beginning, we produce who's who. We got off track. Lack of finance and lack of support. No blame is on her. We have to accept the responsibility for not supporting the school as the school should have been supported and thinking that we're going to get the best result without the best kind of support. It ain't going to happen. Brother Larry, when
when he got his Bachelor of Science degree, came to work at Muhammad University under Sister Shelby. He worked for three years. Then he went and got his master's degree in education. Then he went and got his Ph.D. in education. And is now a man with administrative knowledge over charter schools. Has helped to set them up. I like that part of his knowledge, but that ain't moved me yet. But what I heard coming out of him was his love for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and his educational ideas. So I have hired him unfortunately at half the salary that he makes I just couldn't afford to give him all that big money yet but if 10,000 people Give me one thousand dollars. I'll hire the best that money can buy. For what? This man has knowledge that we will go online. I ask every family to get a computer in your house. I'm going to make a demand. I don't give a damn what kind of money you make. You sacrifice and get a computer in your house. We're going online and from Chicago. Every Muhammad University will be uniform with uniform standards and a uniform curriculum. And if you want to homeschool your child, We'll come to you online with the best professors with a way of testing you and giving you credentials and diplomas. Sister Shelby, I have asked to assist him because some of us, when we bring somebody new in, we like to dog the person that one is superseding. That will not happen here. That will not happen here. He is going to build on the work that she and others have done and take us to new levels. But I have asked her, would she help him achieve the goals that he has set? And her answer was, yes, sir. Thank you, Brother Larry. Thank you, Sister Shelby. Well, some of you will ultimately have to give way to somebody else. These are not lifetime posts. The only lifetime post we have is that of a Muslim. I never heard it in the Quran, die not unless you die the death of a minister. (laughs) 
die not unless you die the death of a Muslim. Now, we're going to build Chicago, but if you back me, I intend to take Moss number four out of her dilemma and help establish Moss 27 in Los Angeles. But I don't want you fundraising for yourself. You're going to fundraise for me, and I will fundraise for you. Mm. See, I don't want nobody siphoning off nothing for the siphoners. You call it skimming? Yeah, we got some skimmers. But I'm putting on the dimmers for the skimmers. We got a nation to build. The stronger you make me to lift him up, the stronger I will make you. But don't you take from me to build yourself. Will a man rob God? Hell yeah. You give him a chance to. I want to know. I don't, I, you know, raising hands. You know, hypocrites raise their hands just as fast as a believer. I'm not looking for show. I'm really looking for sincerity. Because as I atone, you atone. As I sacrifice, you sacrifice. As I pray, you pray. As I fast, you fast. Now what I need from the nation, I want those who are knowledgeable of strategic planning come forth. Because we have to plan the next five and ten years of national development. Wait a minute. Every mosque will have a part in the plan with benchmarks to meet and accountability if you don't meet the benchmark, we want to know what's wrong with you. I'm not asking any of you to be the visionary for your city. We're going to give you the vision of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and we collectively will work to make his vision real in every city where there's a believer, where there's a mosque. Now I'm going to ask, how many of you I'm going to say this before I say this. I'm talking to the people now in the mosques. If I even hear that you're giving my helpers here hell when they come home, I personally will punish you. And I want to tell you the power that I have since I don't talk like that much. But it's time that you know the man that you've been walking with and playing with. The Bible says, when God gave Peter the key, he 
said, he whom you bind on earth, I will bind in heaven. And he whom you loose on earth, I will loose in heaven. A sister from Phoenix in 82 had a vision where she was spoken to by Master Farad Muhammad. And she came to me and told me what the Savior told her to tell her, tell me. And one of the things he told me was, get rid of all your laborers. Not some. All. And the next thing he said was, I can't give him better if he doesn't get rid of what he has. That was very painful for me to hear. But I saw in 82 where some of us was looking like snakes. We had gotten so puffed up. I never asked for Mars to be set up. I set up study groups. But some of the old ones that knew that they came out of a mosque, they wanted a mosque. But the moment you have a mosque, somebody want to be the minister, somebody want to be the captain, somebody want to be in trouble, uh, in 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 in, in uh, position of power, somebody wants to get in trouble with God for messing up the people. So, I took away all titles. And when I did that, people walked out on me. Because they loved the title more than they loved the principle of brotherhood. Some even called me a hypocrite, said I was doing what Wallace did. But any of you that's qualified to wear the title, stand up. Test you in front of the world. I'll show you how. And the first test will be your record. Because you don't want already. Not to think if I ask you about the Constitution, most of you failed that. Not to think about the lessons and the teaching. What are you teaching the people? If you don't know his teaching, what are you teaching them? So don't be upset with me. I'm going to try to qualify you as best I can so you can occupy that position. And there are some among you that already have shown me that you love this word and you really want to be this. I've heard your preaching and I know you're good at what you do. Not good enough for the requirement of the time. Now, we can go back and teach exactly what the messenger taught. That's safe, but it's out of time. Yeah, it is. Well, you've been trying it. You don't get no results. So you can go teach Yakut's history. Do you know what you're talking about? Well, I read it in message. To, I know what you read in message to the black man. I read that too. You going to teach Jesus history? Go ahead. I, I, I read that too. But here's what the messenger of Allah said to me. Brother, I don't want you to teach the history like I taught it 40 years ago. Teach the meaning of it. Well, how is he going to command me 
to teach the meaning when he know he didn't teach me the meaning. But I'm in a position now to be taught the meaning of these histories from him who taught me from the wheel. So you don't try to go in front of me. with your Columbus self. So let's go back over the teachings so that we can make it so universal that everybody, like when they were in the upper room, everybody heard the apostle speaking in their language. When you really understand the messenger's teaching, you can talk to the whole world. So in conclusion, I'm going to ask how many of you will strive to make that sacrifice by Savior's Day, to help me, I'm spending two million, you bring me back ten. And I'll spend the ten plus the forty to help us make his word bond. How many of you are going to help me? Let me see your hand. Okay, there's about 800 in here. But 10,000 is what I want. Yes, well, I don't know. I don't know where they are. You find them. Yes, don't tell me they ain't in the mosque. Go where they are. Yes, tell them the minister is asking. Yes, you say you love him, help him. And by the time you get here, Savior's Day, we're going to be a new nation, and you're going to see a new headquarters with some new administrators. And by Savior's Day, you better come back ready to report your progress in the ministry and how you have used deliberate, lawful dialogue to solve some of the problems in your house. And let's say we said it now, next September, we'll meet again, inshallah, right here, right here, to look at where we've gone one year from our determination to make his word. Now, yeah, you can give a million. Make it easy for me. No, I think that there are people out there, there are believers that want to help me. They know I'm not a crook. You have allowed me to live well, and I appreciate it, but living well when my people don't have nothing means nothing. Help us. We got to get together to help the believer satisfy their needs and then move out beyond the mosque to our people. Are you going to help me? I'm going to close. Where's my Bible? Sit down, please. You may say, you may say, well, how can we do this with the dollar falling? The economy collapsing. America falling. Farrakhan, come on now. You've got us all fired up. But reality outside this door is 
that the nation in which we live is in a decline. So how are we going to get money when people are suffering? Well, the God that I serve is not a liar. If you were living in the desert of Arabia and he promised you gardens wherein rivers flow with pomegranate trees and this, see that's heaven to an Arab. We already got gardens. Some of us. We turn on the water faucet. Bad water, but it's something running. That's not appealing to the desert Arab that's in the wilderness. So the Savior said, money. Good homes. Friendship. In all walk of life. Is he able to? To keep us through the storm. Is he able to feed us during the time of famine? Is he able to save us when things around us are dying and going down? Isaiah the prophet said his arm is not too short that it cannot save yesterday and a scripture just popped in my head and I got up this morning and went to look for it. And I found this. Talking about Samson, he went down and talked with the woman and she pleased Samson well. And after a time, he returned to take her. A woman had his attention. And when a woman got a man's attention, it takes something powerful to get his attention. So it said he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. Bees don't make honey in no unclean place. Go home tonight. Turn to the 16th surah. It's called the bee. It says the bee, guided by instinct, which is called the revelation, gathers together sweet honey from flowers of all kinds, taking what is best in them, thus producing a beverage of many hues in which is healing for men. I hear some bees in the Bible making honey in a dirty place, in a carcass. Here's a young lion that's dying, but there's some workers for God in the carcass of the lion, busy, busy, busy making a hue that will be a healing for the people. And when you finish making your honey, it said all kind of hues will come up. Look in this room. Look at the hues that are here. 
Look at the hues that are outside this room, the colors. You think there's no money for you? The Bible says, and I close, and even the Gentiles will come to the brightness of thy rising. And the messenger of Allah said to us, some of us, that the money is not over there. The money is over here. And it will be released to us at the proper time. So if you join me in atonement for our failure to make his word bond and call him into the circle to do what is impossible for Negroes, but possible for Muslims, to make his word bond. And when you lift him up, all men will be drawn unto him. The Muslim shriners will come. And many rich, rich white people who know they destroyed us as a people. But when they see the work that we do in his name, they'll write a check. Do you believe that? Yes, Can we make honey in the carcass of a dead lion? Yes, then let's make your word bond, my word bond, by making his word bond. Thank you for listening and may Allah bless you as I greet you in peace, praying that we will go to work when we get home. Not showing off authority, but showing off our willingness to serve. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Enjoy yourself. When the conference is over, feel free to walk around the property. I live just beyond those trees. You can come over and, and greet your brother. I'll be there, inshallah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Brothers and sisters, Dr. Aleem, who has headed up this great conference, has said that the only thing left for you to do is to fill out the questionnaire. But physically, the conference is adjourned. And the barbecue is out there, man. <laughs> so if they can stay in their places, we'll pass the questionnaire out. Stay in your places, and there's a questionnaire that we want you to fill out. And then you can enjoy the rest of the day, enjoy the property. And also, we only have 34 days till we go to Atlanta. <laughs> My daughter, Maria, wanted to host a Louis Farrakhan Prostate Cancer Foundation Walkathon on Saturday, October the 13th in Atlanta. We only have 34 days until the walkathon, but 
what we're doing, if we register for the walkathon, whether you're coming to Atlanta or not, you will help a black person, a male black person in Georgia to get a free screening for prostate cancer. Well, it won't actually be free, but they won't have to pay. It's those of us that are walking. Now, I said I would like to walk the two miles. So I'm going to, with God's help, be in Georgia on Thursday night. It's the will of Allah, be at the mosque on Friday. The walkathon is on Saturday. And all the soldiers that are coming to Atlanta walk with me. And all those who are victims of prostate cancer whom God has spared can walk with me. And if there are those of you who are 40 and above who have not had that screening, you take advantage of it and get that screening yourself, okay? I don't want one man to suffer the pain that I've gone through when I know that early detection can actually save your life. It will be a two-mile walk that starts at Clark Atlanta University Stadium and ends with a family day in the park. We will have a variety of health screenings, prostate cancer screening, vending, entertainment, etc. Now, on the following Tuesday, which is the 16th of October, the actual Day of Atonement, we have the Civic Center. I know it's small. It only seats 5,500 people. But there will be other venues available. But I want the Day of Atonement to be in every city. And I have prepared a message for that day that I think you would be happy to hear. Any other business? Oh, yeah. If I may re present you with these reports, the first one is a compilation of all of the work of the Atonement Commission, the Executive Committee, and with the addition of this one, this conference as well. So all of the work that has been done over the last six years is contained in those reports and represents a national agenda for the Nation of Islam for your consideration. Thank you. Brothers and sisters, I want to thank Sister Lydia, Brother uh, Richard, and the staff that worked through the night to get there. Where's Sister Courtney? Thank you, thank you, thank you. All the 30 circles, all your work is right here. And every one of you will be able to get a copy, not only of your work, but the work of the other circles. There are 800 copies of this available right now, so don't leave until you get yours. Please be seated. They're going to have prayer and pass out a questionnaire. Assalamu alaikum. Let's give the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan a round of applause as he exits the building. All praises due to Allah. All praises due to Allah.